When you get your first brew going, you may notice that when you're looking at your measurements, and I'll direct your attention down here to the lower right hand corner of my screen where my cursor is, and you'll see here that for me, I have got the proper date and time for my location. But when I first started, I noticed that this was still in the Netherlands time zone by default and it needed to be changed and I didn't find that intuitive because it's not in the manual. So you'll first see this screen uh, and when you log into your uh, account with BrewBrain and where you're going to look to change that setting is going to your user panel and then under my information you'll see here <coughs> where the user time zone field is down here and it took a little bit to figure out that they use the prefix America and they also don't note there that autofill is turned on to help you complete this and you're going to need to pick one of the settings that they offer in the autofill or it's simply not going to find you. So I thought to myself well what about if I in some other location that isn't in the autofill. So what I did was looked at a few of the first customers that have purchased the float from us and are probably still waiting for it to be delivered and I'll take somebody like Gary that lives somewhere I've never heard of which is Paonia, excuse if I made a mistake on the pronunciation, Colorado. So I go and look on Google <coughs> and I see that the largest city that's around it is probably Grand Junction and so now I go back here and what would happen if we typed in America and then Grand no no Grand Junction so let's go back to the map and in fact you can see down here now that I can start scrolling through what is available and there is no America Grand Junction and that happened to me uh, I needed I'm closest to the city of Calgary which is not listed here so then I had to pick Edmonton which is still in the appropriate time zone so now let's go back to this map and uh, I'm just going to have to keep looking and see what else might be a good candidate for something that's in my time zone and um, how about something like uh, perhaps Telluride, <coughs> um, Crested Butte, something like this. So now we'll go back here, America, and start with a T and uh, no Telluride. All right, how about Crested Butte? Nope, Creston is actually in British Columbia, Canada. My aunt used to live there, and so that's in the Pacific time zone. So you just have to keep hunting and pecking if you're in some small town. And uh, Denver, lo and behold, over here, surely that's going to be in there and although this map doesn't seem to have the time zones delimited on them I'm going to assume for the purpose of this exercise that Peonia is in the same time zone as Denver so now we go back to America we do a D and here we've got Denver so there we go now we have found uh, this is what Gary would put in. Now how about Matt who lives in Barrie, Ontario? They don't have the, um, and that's in Canada by the way, they don't have the provinces listed here under America. So again you're just looking for towns and uh, there is no Barrie, Ontario. However, um, we do know that uh, Toronto is the capital and Mississauga they don't have Mississauga so they do have Toronto 
So there, that's what Matt would put in for his location in Barrie. And then uh, we're looking at data for a brood that I just started yesterday. And one thing I noticed when I started, I had fully charged the battery, and this has happened twice. And I see a statistic that it's at, if you can see where my cursor is circling right here now, that's the percentage of charge that uh, has been calculated based on an algorithm. And I started out, it said somewhere else 75%, roughly in that area here, you can see 73, 72%. And if we look at the table here, battery voltage is this one, and that's the percentage. So the battery seems to be charging at a full charge around four volts. Now the nominal uh, high cutoff charge voltage for a standard 18650 lithium cobalt ion cell is 4.2 volts. Uh, if you do charge to about 80% state of charge, however, you do get a much longer life in terms of how many more cycles your battery is capable of. And so I'm wondering if perhaps BrewBrain has implemented an algorithm to shut off the charging at 4 volts rather than uh, 4.2. However, that would result in you seeing a lower rate. And so wondering if I perhaps had a bad battery uh, which needed to be addressed right from the get-go, I thought I might look at some of the other brews that are posted on the public area and just see where they started out. So these are new ones that just got going here today. And if I show the data in the table for this uh, person's brew, I see their battery also seems to have started out about uh, 4 volts. So this seems to be consistent if I uh, check back through quite a few of the other ones and uh, here his stuff is in the graph form but again you can look down here to where the voltage started out and his started out here at 3.84 and indeed it seems that if we go through a bunch of these they do seem to be consistent in around the area where they're starting out uh, with very close to the range of uh, 4 four volts rather than 4.2 which is kind of the uh, normal standard for chargers that deal with those. So I have put in an inquiry to the folks at BrewBrain uh, to confirm my suspicions that their charging algorithm charges up to around the 4 volt mark and then shuts off and so that would indicate that I don't have a faulty battery and it would also indicate that this algorithm is going to be protecting well I guess protecting isn't the correct word it'd be more appropriate to say it's extending the uh, life cycle in terms of recharge cycles I can expect from that cell by giving me less than the hundred percent state of charge because batteries and you can look this up by googling it especially good site is uh, battery university and um, you'll see that uh, any bike riders for example have long been in the habit of charging their battery packs to something like let's say um, a point eight uh, state of charge in order to extend the battery life. And I think the statistics show that even at cutting off 4.1 per cell considerably extends the lifespan of your battery. So I would say, uh, and I will update in the notes before, below when I hear from them, that do not stress seeing uh, a 75% charge in your battery when you first get started it does not appear to be a faulty battery. This represents my first batch of brew that I started yesterday with the float so I'm still formulating what I would refer to as my list of best practices when I start my next batch 
And one of the things on that list is I'm going to direct your attention down here to the lower right again where I'm circling with my cursor. And you can see here that um, right there, the time value, uh, the date is fine, but I started the float by switching it on at whatever random time that I felt like uh, when I was ready. And I end up now with the increments because the float apparently, uh, my understanding is, is that it does 15 minute updates. So if that's truly the case, and sometimes I see that it misses them, uh, and then I might go for an ex another period or two periods before it catches up. But it is what it is, and irregardless, I'm always looking at this incremental value here that isn't really easy to calculate when I can expect my next update. And normally that wouldn't be important, except for when you can see over here that when I started, my temperature, in spite of having it in a snowbank outside in the backyard when it was minus 20, when I took it out of the brew kettle and put it into the uh, Firmzilla all-rounder, the temperature was still pretty high. And in fact, it exceeds what float recommends for operating temperatures. It didn't seem to harm my float though. And you can see here where the snowbank worked up to the point where I really had to get to bed. And again, I've learned my lesson, don't start your brew day around supper time. And then when I brought it in and stuck it in my brew closet overnight, it was really having trouble getting down to where I want to pitch the yeast, which I'm about to do when I'm finished this. And I finally had to put a wet towel with a fan on it to get it down to the 20 that I needed in order to pitch the yeast that I'm using. So in order to um, gauge that, I was wanting to look at that last night as often as possible when it updated. And I found that um, due to my very small brain, I had to use all my math powers of counting on my fingers to add 15 to this value down here. and. Now, in retrospect, what I would do was I would switch the float on right at the top of the hour or at one of the 15 minute increments that follows the top of the hour. So example 12, 12, 15, 12, 30, 12, 45 or one again. And then I know if I'm wandering around doing other things when I can come back and check my screen and reasonably expect to find an update here. And while I'm on it, um, I should also mention that I found that um, there's a Chrome program called Super Easy Auto Refresh that uh, I use in order to update my brew brain. I find that I can't really count on it to automatically refresh. At least that's what I've seen so far. So if you're using Chrome, you might find that this plugin will come in handy uh, for refreshing your brew brain page. And I think it appears as though it's also uh, making it so that I don't get timed out and automatically logged out of the brew brain site either. So this may have two advantages to you to use it when you're using it with your BrewBrain account. So the BrewBrain float is a fairly new product and of course there's going to be a lot of evolution and changes to future versions of it. So I've already contacted the boys in the Netherlands and asked them a few questions and one of the things I asked about was the possibility of getting alerts via email. This for me uh, would be encouraged by right when I got started well and I wanted to pitch my yeast. Um, my temperature was still too high and I'll show you what I mean here if you look here you'll see that um, I started out at 47.4 after I thought my uh, 
brew kettle had cooled enough in a snowbank at minus 20, but in fact it hadn't. And it took me a long time. I finally had to get to bed around this point, put it in the brew closet, and it took way over to about, you can see here, when I finally had a chance to pitch the yeast. It would have been nice if I didn't have to keep opening the closet and checking all the time and know then when I could just go and directly pitch the yeast at about this point. So an email alert would have been nice. Uh, and Steve does confirm that this is on their, on their list for something to consider. Next, um, increasing the timeout values. Again, uh, you'll see up here um, where I've had to put in a refresh Chrome plugin to refresh this page manually every 15 minutes. And uh, that is something that they said they will consider changing so that you don't have to do that with a plugin. For now, I'm finding that that plugin works fine. More device integration. Um, I would, I presently have, this is what my brew closet looks like. And in the upper left here, you can see my uh, inexpensive little controller that a lot of home brewers use is the uh, SC1000. And that controls a power bar, which in turn controls that light that's got one of those ceramic chicken coop heaters in it and that's what keeps the closet at a constant temperature which right now I've got set to try and maintain a range between 19.5 and 20 C which is what the yeast that I'm currently using apparently that's the optimal temperature for it. Um, I found that, and Steve mentioned this to me, the buildup of Krausen on the float body can uh, affect the readings you're getting. And uh, again, I can show you here where notice that uh, on the batch I've got going right now, I'll direct your attention to this specific gravity chart here. And see here where I noticed there was uh, a little rounded top. So right about here at this point, I went in and uh, swirled the fermenter around because there was some Krausen already stuck on the float. And you can see the result was a slight increase in the specific gravity until things got itself sorted out and it got back on track again to where I wanted it to be. So there are times when it is beneficial to, you may even have to remove the device in order to uh, clean it and one of the ways I thought would be put a magnet in the cap but Steve thinks that uh, that might be difficult from an engineering standpoint it will affect all kinds of things for especially in the calibration but they are considering an injection molded housing for the next generation of floats so that's something we'll look forward to uh, I pointed this out earlier and again I'm going to direct your attention down here to where my cursor is. Um, I did find that having the seconds value at the very end of um, my measurement display was unnecessary and Steve does think that they may be able to change the way you show that format but because data is logged in seconds the brain wakes up after 900 seconds and sends the new data reading out so which is 15 minutes approximately so um, that's something that they're going to keep in mind and that's about it for what's on my list for now but if you've got any suggestions um, if you want to drop them in the comments below I'll make sure they make their way to brew brain I can 
basically be the um, coordinator for collating them and sending anything in all at once. So if you have a problem with your float that's not covered in the manual, which is something that will probably be constantly changing and I've offered to help with that, you can contact the boys in the Netherlands directly at support at brewbrain.nl remember what time zone they're in and uh, you can expect a pretty quick response from them. Also if you have any questions regarding North American sales uh, feel free to drop me a note here at my personal email or for web or ordering or more information on anything in the North American ecosystem here is a website that you can use that address.